Welcome to the Attorney Post, your source for inside baseball talk about the legal field with the top attorneys in the country. Here's your host, Justin West. All right, and I think we are live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to the Attorney Post, where we discuss the various facets going on in the world of law today with attorneys that are at the top of their game. Remember, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. And the number one way to know your rights is to talk to people that are experts in that field. Uh, I am really pleased today to be joined uh, with Jeremy Rosen. Uh, he is an attorney over there and a partner with Horowitz and Levy. Levy, Levy, I just did it. I told you in the pre-roll that I'd, I'd biff it. <laughs> um, we'll come back and we'll get the pro proper pronunciation on it in a minute. Um, but we're going to have a really interesting conversation today. He is an appellate attorney and he's got some interesting insights uh, on multiple things, including free speech and judicial nominations. Um, if we come over here, I'm going to show you their website, as we always do. Uh, this is uh, Horowitz and Levy. And you can see all of the stuff that they do, all sorts of stuff. It's a very, very large law firm. So we'll talk about that shortly. But first, of course, as always, we're going to do a read from one of our sponsors. And our first sponsor is going to be Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers. Are you a business owner that knows that being on the top of page one is important, but you're afraid to work with an SEO company because you know that SEO is expensive and oftentimes very slow? Well, not anymore. Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers forces you to page one of Google safely, and legally through the power of the news media. Rocket SEO utilizes national news media campaigns that across a gamut of news sites that rank you instantly. They can boost your website's ranking in Google in one week or less with a simple system that leverages the power of major media companies and network affiliates of ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, as well as the Boston Herald, the Sacramento Bee, and all stops in between. Uh, they can put you on page one of Google in one week or left less, oftentimes two or three times on page one, many times for dozens of keywords all at the same time. For more information, you can visit them online at hundredsofcustomers.com slash rocket. That's hundredsofcustomers.com slash rocket rockets we'll come back over here really quickly and then we'll join over here and i am now joined by jeremy how are you doing jeremy good thanks great to be here awesome well thank you for being with me so jeremy is a partner over at horovitz and levy 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 it's levy it's levy i levy. remember <laughs> <laughs> uh and, and it actually has been called california's most successful civil appellate practice by the national law journal so that is one heck of a of a of a of a praise of of your of your firm there uh so he's a partner he joined in 2001 uh he is a california state bar certified appellate specialist and a member of the california academy of appellate lawyers he is a graduate of duke university school of law he got his jd and llm um back in 97 uh he also went to cornell university got his ba uh in cornell as well in 93 he's nationally renowned for his proficiency in numerous issues arising under the first amendment uh and california's anti slap law which we're going to talk about here in a little bit uh using that knowledge jeremy has helped a wide variety of clients including churches private businesses and individuals defeat lawsuits that seek to impose liability on clients for exercising their rights of petition free speech and free exercise of religion He's also handled hundreds of appeals in numerous appellate courts, including the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the California Supreme Court, and California's Intermediate Appellate Courts. In addition to the First Amendment, anti-slap cases, he's been involved in numerous important issues regarding antitrust, class action, wage and hour law, employment law, breach of contract, intellectual property, etc. Uh, he directed the Pepperdine University uh, School of Law Ninth Circuit Appellate Advocacy Clinic for six years. Uh, the clinic represents individuals in the Ninth Circuit who are identified by the court as needing pro bono counsel. And he's also a member of the National Chamber of Litigation, uh, or sorry, the National Chamber of Litigation Center's California Litigation Advisory Committee, uh, etc. So, so uh, question number one that I always ask everyone is, Jeremy, what did I miss? <laughs> well, you probably didn't need to list everything that, that you did, but, uh, but uh, it was very kind of you for that uh, introduction. Um, I think in terms, of, in terms of my legal practice, I think you covered it all. I, I would say the one thing you missed is sort of my, what I would say, some of my uh, community involvement. I'm uh, very pleased to be on the board of my synagogue, Stephen Weiss Temple in Los Angeles, as well as on the board of Wise Readers to Leaders, which is a wonderful program that provides uh, literacy uh, enhancements to a lot of underprivileged kids in Los Angeles through summer, used to be only summer programs. We've now made it a year round literacy program that's had a lot of success helping a lot of kids. And I'm really oh, wow. Proud. That's really cool. Um, maybe we'll come back and talk about that at the end too, because I love to hear about the stuff that you do, uh, that all of our attorneys do uh, to, to reach out and help their community. So that's really wonderful. Um, well, I guess first questions first, uh, what got you into law and uh, especially appellate law? 
Well, it's interesting. You know, uh, my mom's a lawyer, so I sort of grew up uh, knowing about, about about lawyers. And when I but when I got to college, I, I think I was thinking I was going to be a history PhD, uh, and that was sort of where I was was heading. And then. I sort of had an epiphany one day that I wasn't quite sure how I was going to support myself uh, as a history <laughs> PhD. And as much as I love history, uh, I, I decided maybe I should do something more practical. And I, you know, I, I had been both in high school and college very active on my uh, school's debate teams nationally and liked to argue and uh, liked the intellectual challenge of it. So I thought law school made a lot of sense. And now I've been very fortunate in my practice. I've gotten, you know, with all the constitutional uh, litigation I've done, a lot of that is very historical, especially with, you know, the ascendancy of sort of the originalism as, uh, a, as a mode of constitutional interpretation. A lot of that is a lot of historical research. So uh, I get to have a little bit of my uh, uh, history as well as the law. So it's- Have your cake and eat it too. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was a, I was a, my undergraduate degrees are in philosophy and history. And, uh, and I went and got my master's in philosophy as well. And then I, I left all that behind and went into marketing, et cetera, because I realized that, you know, history and philosophy was qualifying me to ask the deep questions in life, like paper or plastic, or you want fries with that. But I also had a family. Uh, I've got five kids at this point, And I was just like, there's no way I'm going to make it, you know, <laughs> doing, doing what I was doing at the time. So I totally get that. So you got into law uh, and you do a lot of appellate stuff. Um, how did that all come about? Well, again, that that was I was very fortunate to have a wonderful mentor. I, you know, a lot of people. You know, I work with a lot of law students now and uh, for the last number of years, and they're always worried that they don't know exactly what they want to do yet and what how they want to practice law. And I tell them, you don't need to know in law school. You you have time to figure it out. And that was certainly true for me. Um, after law school, I, I I spent a year clerking for a judge on the Central District of California in the District Court. Then I worked at a firm for a year, and then. I had the wonderful opportunity to clerk for a judge on the Ninth Circuit, uh, Judge Fernandez, who's still a very active senior judge on the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and near the tail end of my uh, clerkship, so I'm now like three years out of law school, um, you know, I told him that I was really uh, sad to be uh, you know, ending my clerkship soon because I had really loved the year and it was by far the most fun I'd had a, a, as a lawyer. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. And so I asked him, well, what am I missing? He's like, well, you should be an appellate lawyer, which I honestly had never thought about before. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I did ask him like, well, how, do you, how does one do that? And he actually gave a very specific answer. He's like, well, you should try to get a job at Horvitz and Levy. So <laughs> I think some, and he had a number of former clerks who were lawyers at the firm. And, and uh, he was, as I think most judges are, uh, appellate judges, you know, familiar with, with our firm. Um, and so he gave me a lot to think about. And, you know, a year or so later, uh, I, I found out that Horvitz was looking for uh, sort of mid-level associates. So I applied and that was almost 20 years ago and haven't looked back. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So what's the best part about appellate law? What, what really fascinates you about it? The best part is you, re you really do get time to think uh, and really develop your arguments. You know, we do a lot of consulting in trial courts, so, uh, you know, so I am familiar with the pace and things that happen in trial courts. And a lot of trial court work, it's not that it's not intellectual, it's just, it's just you, you're moving from one crisis to another uh, and you, you're, you're dealing with trying to develop the facts as well as the law and there's just a lot going and there's discovery disputes and there's all these things and, and tight deadlines. And so it can be difficult to really sit back and think and ponder, you know, what, you know, as you said, for philosophy, you know, what, 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 what is the meaning of life, but that is true, you know, appellate lawyers and appellate judges have the luxury of time to, you know, really think through issues. And, you know, I know a lot of my, my friends who are trial lawyers and, and a lot of my friends who are trial judges uh, get very frustrated with us appellate lawyers because, you know, they'll say, you know, we have to make, you know, decisions in the heat of the moment in the middle of trial. And then you get to sit on your butt in your office for three months to, to, to parse out everything I did, you know, uh, you know, on the spur of the moment. And then you have all this time to write, you know, a lengthy comprehensive brief to, to make us all look foolish for the decision we made, uh, which, you know, I feel bad. Uh, uh, I think trial judges, uh, they're, you know, they are the hardest working, I think, judges, uh, uh, in, in our court system, and 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 many of them are extremely uh, extremely capable in providing outstanding service to us. But it is difficult uh, to make you know hundreds of decisions in a short period of time uh, and, and get them all right. Uh, you know, we do have the luxury of time to sort of sit back and, and parse them apart and and uh, you know get them reversed from time to time. So, but that that is that is that's a, sort of a puzzle, and and I enjoy that aspect of sort of figuring out 
where the mistakes were made and, and how to present that to the appellate court. Gotcha. I hadn't really thought about the time frame that uh, different attorneys work under. I mean, obviously, some attorneys work under, you know, crucial deadlines, but I never really thought about uh, certain facets being far more relaxed. I mean, I talk to like a state planning attorney sometimes. I mean, they unless somebody just died, you know, it's really more of a, a, a slow process. But I didn't really think about that in the, in the terms of the, uh, the appellate. Well, uh, for, for your garden variety appeal, it's a pretty drawn out process. And most appellate courts are pretty generous with uh, even giving additional extensions of time. Now, there are times, of course, where you're seeking emergency interlocutory review through a writ petition, you know, where something really bad is happening that you need to stop immediately. And so then, obviously, you know, it sort of drop everything and, you know, work late at night uh, and, and get, get it done, just you know, much like trial practice. And a lot of appellate lawyers these days, including myself and my firm, you know, we're very involved um, in consulting during trial, you know, a lot of you know, clients are getting sophisticated and they like to now embed uh, a, an appellate lawyer with their trial team to make sure that all the legal issues are preserved and to make sure uh, that everything is, you know, perfectly lined up if there needs to be an appeal. Of course, you know, the last 13 months, there haven't been a lot of civil jury trials in California uh, or, 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 or in other places. So, you know, that's taken a bit of a pause, but uh, we expect, uh, pretty soon those trials, uh, the dam's gonna burst and we're gonna have a lot of uh, uh, post COVID trials, I hope uh, for yeah. the justice system just generally and all the people waiting for their day in court. Uh, and so we'll get back to being embedded in, in, in trial teams. And so of course, when you're embedded in the trial team or doing a writ petition, you know, you're, you know, there's lots of tight deadlines, uh, but your, your, your basic, you know, the basic appellate process for your opening and responding and reply briefs and oral argument is, a, is pretty relaxed for legal standards in terms of timing. Gotcha. So you mentioned, uh, obviously, the, the, the great pandemic that's upon us still, uh, the, the COVID plague. I talked to lots of attorneys, and I know that it affects them in lots of different ways. How has, uh, how has coronavirus affected your day-to-day -day life, and has it changed the, the types of cases that you see or deal with at all? It has, in a sense. I mean, the the one I, I will just you know give a shout out to the you know, the, the appellate courts uh, that I most frequently appear in, which is you know the Ninth Circuit, the California Supreme Court, and the California Courts of Appeal. You know, they pivoted very quickly uh, with COVID, and you know they they might have been like a you know a week or two where oral arguments were pushed off, but you know by the end of March last year, you know all the appellate courts were you know pretty much back up and running through you know Zoom or other similar platforms for, for oral arguments. Some were doing it by telephone, like the US Supreme Court, but you know, most were pivoting to some platform. So the appellate courts you know, remained, have remained you know, open pretty much this entire time, even when a lot of trial courts were shut down. So when, you know, when, when, the, when the pandemic started, you know, because there's a huge lag time on appeals, you know, it really didn't affect you know, our existing work because we were working on appeals from trials that had occurred and finished you know, before COVID uh, came. So, you know, we were quite busy with all of that, you know, as those cases sort of concluded, and we've had now 13 months with no civil jury trials, I would say the mix of, of the new appeals we're getting is different than usual. Normally, it's a, it's a mix of, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, appeals after trial, of, you know, appeals in summary judgment, appeals in, you know, probate appeals, uh, in arbitration proceedings, all the different types of appeals. And now, you know, all of the new appeals for the most part, uh, with a few exceptions, because there have been a few Zoom trials and a, and a few bench trials that have been done remotely. You know, the, the, it's all, it, they're, they're all appeals arising out of more motion practice as opposed to uh, full-blown, you know, civil jury trials. But I think that will hopefully again change, you know, not only for us, but just as importantly for all the parties who've been waiting for their day in court uh, that haven't had it. So hopefully, uh, you know, I know the LA Spirit Court and the Cal and the and the federal courts in, in California are all working towards reopening. Some of the smaller counties in California, I think, have already started jury trials uh, or or are about to. So, you know, I think uh, hope is on the way, and you know, I think things are hopefully uh, returning to more normal at least. Yeah, I think I think we all feel like we're on the cusp of just being done for the most part. I think we mostly feel like uh, this is almost all behind us. So uh, God willing, that's, uh, that's yes. where we'll be. <laughs> so let's talk about some of your cases. I know that you uh, played a big part in litigating uh, in some capacity, uh, California's anti-slap laws. Uh, we have a lot of listeners who aren't in California, obviously. So can you explain briefly what the anti-slap law stuff is and then what part you played in that whole process? 
Sure. So, you know, California has had since the 90s uh, an anti-slap statute, and they were one of the first states to have one. But now uh, quite a number of other states, you know, I think more than half, uh, have some form of, of anti-slap statute. And in fact, New York recently uh, strengthened theirs. Texas a number of years ago uh, put in a very strong one. But, but basically, it, SLAP is a, one of these horrible acronyms that stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation, which, you know, uh, uh, you know, I didn't come up with it. It was uh, uh, there were a couple of law professors in the '90s who wrote a series of law review articles that that talked about this issue, and um, and now they have laws named after their law review article in like you know quite a number of states. Uh, so that they, you know, everyone asks, you know, can law can can law professors have impact? Well, sometimes they can, uh, and uh, and this was a uh, uh, professors Pring and uh, Kanan or Kanan, never quite sure how to pronounce that either. Uh, who, who wrote some of the, some of the early uh, work on this in the early 90s. And basically what an anti-slap statute does is it provides an early sort of sub, uh, early basically motion to dismiss uh, against any complaint that seeks to impose liability for uh, your, your uh, for, for, the, for the defendants uh, uh, petitioning conduct, whether you know generally speech uh, related petitioning conduct. Uh, which can be litigation conduct. It comes up oftentimes in most uh, most defamation claims and most speech-related tort claims, and it basically allows uh, within at least in California statute, you can file the motion within 60 days of the service of the complaint. Uh, when uh, it freezes discovery uh, while the motion is being heard, with some limited exceptions to to get rid of the to to overcome the discovery stay, and. If the defendant can show in the first instance that the complaint seeks to target uh, his or her or its uh, petitioning uh, activity, then the burden shifts to the plaintiff to have to put forward admissible evidence to show a prima facie case. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to have all the evidence. It just means they have to have some evidence to show that a jury could conclude uh, that, the, that the cause of action has what the cases say are minimal merit. Uh, and if the uh, plaintiff cannot make that showing, then the uh, then the cause of, then then the complaint is dismissed. And what's unique about it, and and, and uh, is that uh, un unlike most cases where uh, you can only have an appeal after a final judgment uh, under California and many states anti-slap statutes, you're allowed to have an interlocutory appeal uh, from the denial of an anti-slap motion. I mean, the granting of an anti-slap motion would generally lead to a judgment where you would generally have an appeal anyway, but you, but you also get uh, an appeal if, if you're the moving defendant uh, and the motion was denied. Uh, and then that then stays further actions in the, in the trial court pending the appeal. And that was one of the first significant impacts I had on the uh, anti-slap statute in California. My very first case in the Cal uh, first argument in the California Supreme Court was a case called Varian versus Delfino, which um, has been cited, you know, thousands and thousands of times since 2005 when it came out. It's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's the opinion that I was that I've been involved in that it has by far had the most, you know, impact in terms of citation count. And there, the California Supreme Court uh, agreed with our argument that there is an automatic stay of further trial court proceedings while your appeal is pending from your denial of an anti-slap motion. And uh, a lot of people curse that decision. A lot of people love that decision. Uh, uh, you know, it just depends on uh, which, which, what your perspective is. Okay. Yeah, I was looking at that one earlier. It's one of the first ones that caught my eye. I was vaguely familiar with the uh, the slap stuff, and you've had a few other cases that also dealt with it. Uh, is it Malin versus Singer? In yeah, I mean, I think I've I've sort of lost count, but I think I've been involved in like seventy, give or take, anti slap appeals by this point. Um, and it's, it was actually, you know, I sort of came into this by by happenstance because uh, when when the uh, when, when the Varian case first came into my, my firm's uh, to my firm, it was like early 2002. I had just joined the firm in uh, in October of 2001. It was one of the very first cases I got assigned to, and the anti-slap statute was pretty new at that time, and not a lot of people uh, in in my office knew very much about it. And by the time that case, the Varian case worked its way through the Court of Appeal and then to the Supreme Court, you know, in, in the next three, three years or so, I knew quite a bit about the anti-slap statute. And I remember the, our managing partner at the time came into my office and said, look, none of us know what this new crazy statute is, but it seems like it could be, it could be big. And you seem to know the most of it as anyone, like you should really learn even more and, and become an expert on it because that would be really valuable to the firm. And, and so I went to a lot of seminars and, you know, did, 
read all the decisions that came out and then I would and then I ha handled a few cases here and there and now it's you know well over 70 and I've written I think probably 10 or so articles give or take uh, on the anti-slap statute and uh, spoken on panels uh, about it you know all over so uh, it's also what, what I tell young lawyers who I, I, I tend to mentor a lot of young lawyers and, and law students I always tell them try to find something uh, some new law that that no one else at your firm knows anything about because then you become sort of invaluable as opposed to just another fungible uh, associate uh, and that that's a and, you know it was it was really great that I got the advice to become an expert in that statute when I was a young associate and uh, it certainly served me well hmm. yeah that's fascinating that's uh make yourself almost uh invaluable, you know, by, by, but not quite niching down or pigeonholing yourself, but, you know, finding an area that nobody else really knows about and, and just making that something that you own. So I am speaking with Jeremy Rose and he is one of the foremost experts on anti-slap law, I guess. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's really fun. Now uh, in the, the pre-show a little bit and in, uh, in our, our back and forth communication, Jeremy, you mentioned also that you're, you're very, very passionate uh, about the issue of judicial nominations. I think you told me that you thought that the, the system was broken down. Um, you, you yourself had been a victim of the process, and uh, you think that both of the, the two major parties are generally hypocrites, uh, blocking qualified judicial nominees um, from Senate confirmations, et cetera. So um, I want to pick your brain about that a little bit. Tell me, tell me what gets you riled up. Tell me about your experience and how, how it, it, in a sense, how you became a victim of it. And uh, ultimately, of course, I want to know uh, what changes you'd like to see or, or, or what, what seems like the most pragmatic and, and possible steps that we could take to fix this situa situation. Sure. And, you know, obviously, I, you know, having gone through the process a bit, I, I probably am not uh, an unbiased source, <laughs> although I had thoughts about this, you know, even before I was part of the process. Uh, we don't mind bias sources. I mean, as long as you're <laughs> open that you've got a bias that lets us, you know, bear that in mind and, and, and you know, keep that as, as part of the equation. But I love people that are biased because it means you're passionate about the thing. And it means you can kind of give us much more of the, the inside baseball. So absolutely. Be well, biased. I mean, it, well, it, it starts with my view, which I, I, I think I think is uncontroversial, which is, you know, one of the things that makes, you know, our country special is uh, our tradition of the rule of law uh, and an independent judiciary uh, to enforce uh, and apply and interpret the law. And that makes us, you know, very different from, you know, many, many other countries. And, it, 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 and it, you know, our country certainly has a lot of flaws and we're, we're still very much a work in progress. But, uh, you know, if we didn't have an independent judiciary, we'd have, you know, many, many, many more problems uh, than we do. And in fact, the fact that we have an independent judiciary allows us the space to do things like have protests and to uh, and to have people agitating for you know necessary change and different things and so so I start with the presumption that you know having a, an independent judiciary and to to enforce a neutral rule of law is absolutely vital for you know sort of democracy and for freedom and and and, and for stability and you know I also look you know, for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, you know, I think our nation, unfortunately, has become a lot more polarized and partisan, uh, which I, I think it, it is a shame. You know, it, it used to be that, uh, you know, people had a wide circle of friends with lots of different views. People now tend to be more in their bunkers and, uh, you know, have, you know, ha, you know ha, have most of their friends and acquaintances thinking the same things that they do, which then I think makes it easier to sort of otherize and demonize people who you don't agree with because you don't have them in your life. And I think that's uh, unfortunate. Um, and, you know, I, I always say I'm, I'm a bit of, of the unicorn because if you look, say, at my Facebook friends as sort of a rough approximation of, you know, the people who are in my social circle, uh, you know, they, they, they run the, the gamut from the far left to the far right and sort of everything in between. And, you know, I don't, I probably disagree with all of them on something, uh, but I like them all uh, and, and I respect them as people. But I think uh, a, a, an effect of this increasing polarization just generally in society, which I think comes out in you know, the uh, political races for the presidency and for, and for Congress and, and other things, is that it's begun to seep into, um, into the Article III, into, into, into the judiciary, where uh, I think senators and politicians and interest groups on both sides have over the last decades, and it ke keeps getting worse, uh, you know, attempt to sort of demonize and attack um, you know, what are, for the most part, very highly qualified uh, judicial nominees put forth by both parties. I mean, I start with the presumption that, 
you know, elections have consequences and that, you know, when, when a president is elected, uh, he or she is going to be looking for qualified nominees, not only for the judiciary, but also for the other, for the executive branch that sort of broadly fit within their philosophy. And I think that's okay. So again, I may be the one, you know, unusual person who thinks, who, who support, who would have supported most every uh, nominee, judicial nominee from President Obama, as well as most every judicial nominee from President Trump, because by, by and large, both presidents, uh, I think, appointed highly qualified uh, individuals uh, with, yes, different uh, judicial philosophies, of course, uh, reflecting the different political views of their, of, of, of their differences, but I, you know, I think that's okay. Um, and you know, I have a lot of friends uh, who are judges uh, and you know, again, they run the gamut of, you know, they've been appointed by presidents of quite a number of, uh, you know, quite a number of different presidents of both political parties. And they, they all have probably different philosophies and approaches, but you know, every judge that I know uh, and that I'm friends with, which is you know, quite a number, uh, you know, they take their job very seriously as, uh, and they look at each case and they look at the facts and they look at the law and they do their very best to apply the precedent uh, uh, to, to, to the actual facts. And in, in most situations, you know, most cases, even in the federal courts, you know, if you have a, a judge of goodwill, it doesn't matter who appointed them, they're gonna come to the same result. The problem is, is that it's the handful of, of decisions, mostly a handful of Supreme Court decisions that, that get the bulk of attention. Uh, and, and I think that just sort of increases the sort of the polarization that people have uh, of the judiciary. I mean, you know, the, the, the federal judiciary makes, you know, 10 or 15,000 or more decisions and dispositions each year. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that get public, at public attention are like the, maybe the 10 to 12 most controversial five to four-ish Supreme Court decisions. That's a very small number. And it's, and, 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 and it's, I think, does a disservice to the judiciary as a whole to focus on them to, and, and sort of say yeah, like, that, the, that the judiciary is out of whack. So I think that the you know politicians on both sides are hurting the judiciary by making it seem as if uh, the, the judges being appointed are, are partisan when, when they're not. I mean, I think a perfect example is, you know, I think there were 11 or 12 different judges appointed by President Trump who ruled against him in, in all the series of post-election challenges he brought. Mm -hmm. And if you would listen during the confirmation hearings for all of those judges, you know, the, the Democrats were attacking their integrity that they're just gonna be political actors and partisan hacks and they're not. Uh, and conversely, Republicans attacked, uh, I think unfairly, a lot of the nominees that President Obama made for similar reasons. And, you know, they're not either. I mean, they're doing a, a good job. And so I think that both political parties are doing a grave disservice uh, to, to our judicial branch. And I will say just, you know, my experience, uh, you know, I was, I was nominated, uh, you know, I, I ended up being the longest uh, judicial nominee without a hearing during, I think, the Trump presidency, which not exactly a record I was going for. Uh, <laughs> and basically it was because e even though there had been a, a tentative, a, an agreement reached between the, the White House and Senators Feinstein and then Senator Harris for a compromised slate of judicial nominees in California, that I think were widely, uh, you know, agreed by the entire legal community in California to be a highly qualified group. Senator Harris ultimately backed out of the agreement and did not allow most of the uh, candidates to, to get a hearing, me, me included. And, you know, she didn't do anything that a Republican senator ha hasn't done to, you know, uh, you know uh, the Texas senators held up a lot of President Obama's nominees in Texas. So, you know, uh, so that it's, she's certainly not much worse than than anyone else, but I think it's a it's a, a symptom of, of a broader problem uh, that that is is not going to serve uh, the public very well. Um, you know, of course, the hypocrisy knows no ends. The, the you know part of why she was able to block all the California nominees is because the Senate has this blue slip tradition, uh, which you know for district court nominees, the home state senators have to give their consent before they have a hearing. And uh, the Republican chair of the Judiciary Committee uh, upheld her blue slip. Of course, now I'm reading uh, the, the current chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee is lecturing uh, uh, Republican senators in Texas and elsewhere saying, you better not abuse those blue slips or we might have to get rid of them. It's like, well, okay, well, I think there was a lot of abuse the last three years. I think what, what I would like to see is, is, is no one abusing the blue slips and, and that senators allowing qualified nominees to go forward 
of the opposing party because uh, we're getting to a situation now where you're only going to be able to get judicial nominees judicial nominees confirmed if you have a if the president and the senate are of the same party uh and you're only going to get district court nominees through where the the, the senators uh, both senators in the state are of the same party as the president which i i don't think is particularly healthy mm -hmm. so what do you think the solution is I mean, my my personal solution is turn off all of the 24-hour news channels on both sides and let everyone calm down a little bit. I think that that would be a, a big start, but but that's more of a non-reasonable approach. What, what can we do? What can we, the people, do uh, in order to kind of calm this down and, and make it more rational, do you think? Well, I think it, you know, I think it's going to take time and it's going to be hard because it just keeps getting worse. But I think uh, what what is important is for uh you know, I think it's important for Republicans now to, you know, be generous to President Biden's nominees to uh, to, to the courts uh, and hope that that then gets reciprocated. I mean, the problem is, is that it, it's, it, it, you know, politicians are worse than, you know, middle schoolers, uh, you know, the, you know, because the Democrats, I think, unfairly treated, you know, many judicial nominees in the last administration, me included, uh, you know, th that means they're going to treat uh, you know, President Biden's nominees even worse, uh, and and just and 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 part of why the Democrats treated Trump's nominees so badly is in sort of retribution for how Republicans treated President Obama's nominees, and part of why Republicans treated President Obama's nominees that way is because of how Democrats treated President Bush's nominees. I mean, it's just it's a vicious cycle, and you know, I've tried. I mean, you know, I don't really have a huge platform, but I've tried to do my part over the years. You know, I wrote. Uh, President uh, Obama, one of his uh, nominees to the Ninth Circuit, was a friend of mine. We had colleagues at Munger, Tolson, Olson, Paul Watford. So I wrote uh, a letter supporting his uh, nomination that ended up getting quoted by you know quite a number of senators, and uh, it was in quite a lot of papers uh, because it was so unusual. You know, you know, sort of a, you know, I've been a longtime leader in the federal side, and here I am supporting a you know a, a, you know left wing nominee by uh, President Obama. But as I said then, you know. Uh, you know, I thought Paul was highly qualified. He was one of the most distinguished appellate lawyers in California. He has, he had and has a very great judicial temperament. And I said at the time, like, I'm sure there are going to be some of his decisions I would disagree with, but like, I think he's someone who deserves to be on the court. And I think that's been borne out. Uh, there have been some of his opinions that I look at and I'm like, oh, that's not, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> But I respect him and, and I know he's, I, I know he's not a part, he's not partisan. He's doing his best to apply precedent to the facts. There are some cases that are, you know, where the precedent isn't as clear and there's a little wiggle room and that's where, you know, your, the philosophy of, of, of the particular judge is going to come through on, on the margins in cases. And, and, and I think that's okay. And I think it's good to have diverse views on, on, on courts uh, because I, I think then you're making sure that you're really exploring all the answers. I mean, if you have everyone on a court who thinks the same way that you sort of get groupthink, and I don't think that is particularly healthy either. So, so I think that's the only way is, is but I, I'm not sure, I'm not terribly optimistic that this will happen is that you're going to have to have the out of party, the out of power party sort of rise above the pettiness that has been going on and, and then hopefully shame the in power party to be better when they're out of power, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that, I mean, I, I'll keep, keep doing my little part, but you know, I, you know, I just, I'm not terribly uh, optimistic, but you know, one never knows. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, it sounds like you are following the path that's most likely to bring the, the best amount of change possible, which is to yourself, just be as reasonable as you can be. Understand that we're not going to always see eye to eye and everything, but that, uh, you know, we function best when we function as a, as a whole. I tend to, I, I'm, I'm very middle of the road. I, I tend to lean very libertarian. Uh, so I, I always I always joked I'm, I'm not a Republican because I don't trust big business, but I'm not a Democrat because I don't trust big government either. So I'm always a, uh, I, I don't want either <laughs> at the end of the day. But I do think that there's there's something to be said for making sure that, uh, you know, we're keeping the machine as well oiled as possible so that it can function. I get really concerned uh, when I see a lot of the the political divisiveness and it, it gets easy to, to, to kind of fall into the tribalism, I think, uh, on both sides and both sides think that they're right. And, you know, there's something to be said for if you really think the ideology of the other side is dangerous, then, you know, opposing it is an important thing to do. Um, but of course, we need to be very, very 
moderate in our assertions of, of when it is the case that the actual positions are really dangerous or just ones that we don't really like. There are some that may be. I think it was uh, the famous uh, writer G.K. Chesterton. I think he talked. He, he said, uh, "There's some all thought is good thought, except for the thought that ends all thought, or something like that." He's like, "There's there there are some some thoughts that kill thinking because they they." they are it's like 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 using free speech to argue against free speech in a sense and like basically it's the one thing you shouldn't do because it although free speech says you should be able to make your case and in the, the marketplace of ideas but there does come a point where you can curtail everyone else's ability to exercise free speech through your use of free speech or something along those lines so i guess i guess it's, it's hard to know exactly where the sand the, the line in the sand is drawn and, and whether or not that's the line right before the cliff edge or just an arbitrary line that yeah we could probably step over it and be fine so um on a related note i know that you are an expert in uh, a lot of areas related to the first amendment obviously as a libertarian that's something that's near and dear to my heart what do you think are some of the biggest um challenges especially in the in the the the, the post-election 2020 world we've seen lots of censorship online uh whether or not that's you know just independent companies doing their own thing whether those are violations of you know some sort of you know section 230 or, or whatnot what do you think are some of the biggest issues uh that you've seen whether or not it's related to the election i don't care um but but related to free speech well and i i think this is where you know, some of the discourse is disingenuous because I think a lot of what's happening with some of the private companies, while not necessarily and probably not a violation of the First Amendment, that doesn't mean that it's not troubling. Uh, I tend to be of the view that 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 you should allow people to speak, uh, you know, pretty much with with very little uh, limitation. Uh, I, I think that I do believe in in, in allowing the marketplace of ideas uh, to work. Uh, and I, I think that when you, whether it's a government uh, or a large company, however it might be, when you when you start uh, censoring and, and, and denying people platforms that you give based on ideology, I think all that does is it is it is it it increases extremism, and it and it drives people underground into darker uh, places. Uh, whereas I I think we're much better off having. You know, even with things that we might all agree, or most of us would agree, are very disturbing ideologies, we're much better off seeing that on Twitter or Facebook than we are knowing that they're still existing, but in some underground thing that none of us see. Like, you know, I, I think that's very dangerous. And so, uh, and, and I also just think, again, it's sort of part of the polarization of the times. And, and I worry, I see it in schools and universities. Uh, I see it on with Facebook and Twitter. It's this notion that there are some views that we're just not going to allow uh, and, and we're going to be sort of some moral arbiter uh, and, and just not allow certain things to be said. And I think that's just very dangerous. I, th I think you need to allow people to say to say what they want. Uh, you can disagree with them, sure. You, you can vehemently disagree with them uh, if necessary. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's very troubling to, uh, you know, to, to have um, you know, to, to, to have this sort of censorship, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you know, whether Section 230, I mean, there's lots of reforms going about. I mean, part of the problem is, is that, you know, politicians are, are viewing this for, for, you know, sort of crass political motives on both sides, as opposed to, I think, looking at, you know, what, what I think is, is right, which is, I, I think, generally, we, 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 a free society, people should be able to speak freely. I, I mean, you know, even, even if we don't like what they have to say, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see lots of things out there I don't like, but, you know, I, I go on, I go on with my life and I, I make the points I want to make. And so I do think, uh, I do think that, that, that there is going to be a reckoning of some sort, what that is, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think we're, we're getting, I mean, we're, we're just getting to, I think, a very disturbing place where, you know, uh, pe people are being fired because they say one inappropriate thing uh, or one you know stupid comment. You know, and I just, I just, I just don't, I, I, I don't think that's particularly healthy. Whether you call it cancel culture or something else, uh, you know, and 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 the response to it is, is a lot that I've been seeing lately as well. What about you know, no one stood up, you know, no one complained when the Dixie Chicks were kicked off country music. Well, I think that was wrong too. I mean, I, I think. You know, I think it's wrong when conservatives try to shut down liberal voices, and I think it's wrong when liberals try to shut down conservative voices. I, I think that increase that just contributes to our, our polarizing uh, times, which I think is unhealthy. I think we need to do more to recognize. You know, I think most people. My view is that most people are essentially good. There are there are a few people who are bad. That's to be sure. But 
you know, and, and I guess I don't view who you vote for for president or what your views are on certain political issues as, as having much of a, uh, of a bearing on whether you're a good or a bad person. Like to me, it's, you know, are you helping those in need in your community? Are you, are you, you know, are you, are you a good, you know, husband or wife or father or mother? Are you, are you a good child, you know, to your parent, to your elderly parents? Are you, you know, are you active in your, uh, church or synagogue? Are you trying to make the world, you know, are you trying to help people out who need a hand? I mean, uh, do you help a friend who's in need? I mean, these are the things that I look, I mean, that's why, I, you know, I have friends with, you know, wildly divergent views. I always joke that, you know, like, you know, in, in the late 2000s, uh, 2000, uh, 2008 or not, when it went, you know, you had the, you had sort of the twin movements of you had the Occupy Wall Street protests, mm -hmm. and then you had the Tea Party protests. And I had friends on Facebook going to both of them, and I didn't mm -hmm. do it either. But I'm <laughs> like, well, that's fine if that's, you know, uh, yeah, but I, I, but, you know, I didn't judge them you know, for, for the protests they were going to. I judged them on, on other, uh, you know, are they a good friend? Are they a good person? And, and I think that's where we're falling short. I mean, part of it is, is, you know, I just live it at home. My wife and I have very different uh, political views. Uh, and when we first met in college, I would say we had even more divergent views because uh, like most college students, we, we, we didn't have the burden of life experience or wisdom. So we were far <laughs> more, uh, you know, we were on far more the extreme side of the, of the, of the ideology here on the left, me on the right. And, uh, you know, as we've, you know, grown up and old and now have, you know, do have some benefit of wisdom and life experience, you know, we probably both moved towards the center and, you know, she's more center left and I'm more center right. And, um, you know, we still disagree on a lot, but we also have a huge amount of respect for each other. And, you know, uh, just because I think some of her views are wrong and she thinks some of my views are wrong doesn't mean that we don't, that we're not the person that we respect the most. So, and I think that's, but I think that's getting lost uh, in society as a whole. People don't uh, respect people who disagree with them. And I think that's a real problem. Yeah. I think there's a big difference between thinking somebody is wrong because of the opinion that they hold, because I, I don't agree with you on X, Y, or Z versus thinking someone's an idiot for the, for the opinion yeah. that they hold. And I, I think that we've really moved away from, I disagree with you and here's why, but I can also state the best possible arguments for your side to you're an idiot because you believe X, Y, and Z, and you're not even worth, you know, talking to. I think we've just really lost civility. And yes. I, I don't really know how to fix that outside of, again, one person at a time, you know, person to person making a difference in, in, in the words of the great Michael Jackson, look at the man in the mirror, right? <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's where the change has to start, I guess. And so, you know, for those of you listening to this podcast or watching, be better, <laughs> be better people. Uh, I think if you're watching this podcast, you probably are one of the good ones, but uh, it's something that we all should definitely be striving for. So um I could talk about this for hours. This is one of the areas that really fascinates me, but um, I don't want to keep you too long. And I do have a few more questions I want to get to here. So uh, we can, uh, we can, we can slowly sally forth here if it makes sense. Um, sure. Let me ask you more of an open-ended question. I know a lot of attorneys, you know, once they've been practicing for going on 20 years, um, they start to come to, you know, they, they, they have wisdom that they didn't have at the beginning and like, man, and we all have this experience in life, right? If I only would have known X, Y, and Z before I got started, things would have been so different. What's something that you wish you would have known when you first got started in law? Well, I think, you know, two things that I've learned. One is, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, client relationships are just not worth pursuing. Like I've been very blessed and have had wonderful Lots and lots of wonderful clients uh, over the years. Uh, you know, I've had a handful that are less wonderful. Uh, and what I, I think I've learned now is that when I sort of see, you know, at the first meeting, like this is not, this is going to be, you know, someone who's going to be more, you know, more, more, more trouble than they're worth and just, you know, not emotionally worth, you know, dealing with. I now feel free, like I'm just not going to represent, the, you know, and, 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 I, and I should say, I don't believe in picking clients based on whether you agree with them. The same thing, I think lawyers should represent, I mean, I've represented plaintiffs, I've represented defendants, I've on lots of issues, you know, even though I, I'm a real passionate uh, believer in the First Amendment, I've, I've taken some cases where I've been on the quote unquote anti-speech side, you know, uh, I, I think lawyers need to be able to represent clients. And I think another thing that's wrong just in general is, is that lawyers get you know, demonize for the clients they represent. I think our system doesn't work if lawyers don't represent clients. But the except my 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 caveat to that is that you know, 
setting aside whether you agree or disagree with the legal position or you know or or the views of your client you you have to be able to have a healthy working relationship with them and you know some clients earlier in my career i would just keep doing everything i could to like keep a client you know happy and satisfied and now i'm realizing you know there are some that are just they're, they're so emote it's life's too short there are some there are just some people just not worth uh, representing so that's one thing i think i've learned the other is to is to is, is, is to not get so worked up about you know opposing counsel i mean i'm a big believer in civility like i, I think you, you can zealously uh represent your client and zealously you know oppose the other side but like but, but the other side's lawyer is not the enemy the other party is not the enemy uh and i think a lot of lawyers have the contrary view that the that they need to you know, belittle and be rude and, you know, to try to play games with opposing counsel. And that used to just really bother me a lot when I was a younger lawyer. And now I'm like, okay, like you're, you know, you're just being stupid and wasting my time. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm just gonna ignore it uh, and do my thing uh, and not get worked up about it, you know? And, and I think that's something that's come with a little, you know, life experience. Yeah. Well, and stress can definitely shorten your life too. So, uh, you know, working with the uh, PETA clients, uh, P-I-T-A, pain in the <clears throat> clients, <Yeah. laughs> uh, you know, definitely, uh, definitely not something that you should worry about too much if you can help it. Obviously, you know, for people in various positions, sometimes you have to take whatever clients you can get, but um, there certainly does come a point where you just got to say no. That's, that's a I life mean, I lesson guess that too. Is, uh, one thing I'm fortunate, you know, you know, uh, being, you know, reasonably successful, you know, I, I can say no to a client and and not be worried that I'm not going to have another one. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I realize that that, that, that does make me fortunate and privileged in, in to some degree, but, um, you know, that, but that, uh, you know, I'm taking advantage of it. <laughs> hey man, milk it if you can, right? <laughs> um, well, here in a minute, I'm going to talk to Jeremy about his biggest failure and his biggest success. Before I do that, I'm going to jump back over here and we're going to read one more message from one of our sponsors. And our second sponsor today is going to be injuryattorneyleads.com. If you're a personal injury attorney, you know that you can regularly spend a lot of money advertising, but most methods yield lackluster results. Often you can pay between $100 and $500 per lead and still wind up getting leads that are not qualified if you even get a hold of them at all. You can often burn through five to 10 just to get a serious prospective client on the phone. The solution is injuryattorneyleads.com. Injuryattorneyleads.com has people reaching out across the country and filling out a form requesting help from an injury attorney. That's where most of their lead generation companies stop, but injury attorneyleads.com is just getting started. They reach out to every person who fills out one of those forms and reaches out to them via the phone and qualifies them or requalifies them, making sure that they were serious form fill outs, getting them on the phone. And only once they have them on the phone, do they then three-way them over to your law firm to make sure that you're actually being able to reach out and get a hold of these people on the phone and not having to spend time chasing them down and possibly never getting a hold of them at all. You can be sure that these potential clients meet your criteria for a qualified lead and close rates average around 60%. You can set up a time to speak with the client generation specialist by visiting injuryattorneyleads.com and clicking on any of the buttons that will lead you to the uh, form to fill out uh, for uh, scheduling a, an interview. Anyway, injuryattorneyleads.com. All right, we'll jump back over here. So Jeremy, tell me a little bit, uh, again, we've all, we all have failures. We all have successes. What's one of the biggest uh, frustrations or fa I, I, the word failure sometimes feels it's overly negative, but we all have moments where it's like, I thought this was going to turn out differently than it did. Um, you know, obviously working with a, with a PETA client can, can be a failure. Um, but what's one of the biggest failures that you've encountered or, or, or had a ruling that just didn't go your way that you thought that was going to go? And what did you learn from that? Well, uh, uh, my biggest and most spectacular public failure was, of course, my judicial nomination, where, <laughs> which, you know, was, you know, announced with great fanfare and like the whole world knows. And then suddenly, you know, you, you, I kept, you know lots of people just kept, you know, texting me like, oh, like, aren't you a judge yet? I'm like, no. <laughs> so that, that, that was, you know, that, that was uh, uh, when that sort of ended at the, the end of last year that, that, you know, that was, you know, that uh, was not fun, but, you know, I think my takeaway from that is there are different ways to, you know, I had, 
you know, I had made the decision with my wife and uh, to, to, that we'd be willing to make the, the, the sacrifice of, you know, a pretty significant pay cut to serve the public uh, as a judge. And then uh, my, my service wasn't wanted. So uh, I now get to stay in private practice, which has, has its benefits. And, and I guess that my takeaway from that is there are other ways, uh, you know, other other ways to serve the public than than as a judge. So I'm sort of doubling down on some of my uh, the board service I'm doing for nonprofits and and other pro bono work, and you know, fi figuring you know, other ways to uh, plus talking speaking out on I think the judicial nominations problem. I've got, I've gotten involved with the Bolch Institute at Duke Law School, run by uh, Judge Levy. Uh, which is an institute that's uh, committed to sort of promoting the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law through a lot of programs. And I think we're going to be trying to do some sort of uh, programs relating to, you know, some of the issues we talked about earlier on, on sort of the politicalization of, of the judiciary and how to, how to stop that. Um, you know, in terms of cases early on in my career, uh, you know, I had sort of the classic bet the company case uh, on appeal and, and we lost uh, and I was really, you know, despond I, I don't generally like losing and fortunately I've won a lot more than I've lost. Uh, but this was particularly hard and I remember the, the sort of the more senior partner who I was working with said well, you know, you know, the, 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 the company was lost uh, when the trial court, you know, blew up the company. Uh, you did your best to try to get that reversed uh, in, in the Court of Appeal and made some great arguments and Court of Appeal uh, didn't didn't agree. Uh, you know, there, there's not much more you could you could have done. And the, the lesson I took from there is like, especially as an appellate lawyer, some some appeals just aren't winnable. Ultimately, uh, you know, you're sort of stuck with the trial court record, the facts that were found. You're stuck with the existing precedent. I mean, you can sometimes get precedent changed a bit if you get up to a Supreme Court, but it's hard. So, you know, uh, uh, even though like 15 plus years later, it's, I, I'm still thinking about that one, um, you know, because uh, I don't like to lose and luckily don't lose that often. But, you know, I, the lesson I learned from that is you sometimes you, you just have to move on to the next case and, you know, do your best each time and like some, th some things are out of your control. Yeah, well, that's fair. So you gotta, gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them. <laughs> And sometimes just accept it when the cards get scattered all over the floor because they do that too sometimes. <laughs> so what's the flip side then? What's one of your biggest successes? What's one of the things you're, you're most proud of in, in, your, uh, in your career? Well, I've been fortunate to have a lot of, a lot of big wins, uh, you know, both you know, saving my clients a lot of money and uh, vindicating important First Amendment rights, either a speech or religion. Um, but there are two probably that, that had the biggest impact just because, uh, you know, because I could see the impact uh, on my on my clients. One is a number of years ago, I represented a, a, a you know, a very small but, uh, but, but, but vibrant uh, African American Baptist church uh, in, uh, in Bakersfield, and uh, they were uh, in the midst of, uh, there were a couple of very dissatisfied members uh, of the church who were basically trying to sort of blow it up through litigation and, and, and had convinced the trial court to do some frankly, really wacky uh, things in terms of uh, overseeing uh, an, in, uh, an election within uh, the church and then not and then not deferring to the church's membership list and allowing all the, uh, sorts of people who were not uh, deemed by the church to be members in good standing to actually vote uh, in the election to which then with all the influx of new votes it allowed uh, the trial court ordered the pastor of the church to be replaced. Uh, and I was able to get the Court of Appeal to to reverse that, and you know it was you know I, I'd gone to I'd met you know a number of members of the church and the, the deacons of the church and through a lot of different because I had argued some of the motions in the trial court and then in the Court of Appeal, and just to see like the the, the joy that they, that their small church was saved and that they could keep going through their worship and you know I still. Keep, uh, I'm still on their sort of email list, so I see even during COVID, they, 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 they like many uh, uh, houses of worship, they've you know shifted to sort of online Bible study and online services and things, and they're and they're still you know every time I get one of those emails, I think like you know if it weren't for me and my team, you know they might not exist, and so it, it makes me really happy that uh, uh, that they not only exist but are continuing to thrive, and they do a lot of good work in their uh, community, and it's just really important. And another sort of bet the company type case years ago, I represented uh, Blueprint Test Prep, which is now now one of the leading LSAT test preparation companies. 
But at the time I represented them, they were sort of the upstart uh, and one of their much larger competitors was trying to destroy them through litigation, which is a common tactic. Uh, uh, competitor, uh, com established companies don't want competition, so they try to litigate their opponents into, into death. And this really was the, the bet the company case. The trial court had issued an injunction um, uh, ordering my client basically to shut down. Uh, and we had filed an emergency motion in the court of appeal and the injunction uh, was to go into effect a Friday morning, uh, and the Court of Appeals set oral argument on our emergency stay order, which is pretty unusual, uh, for Thursday morning. So I had oral argument Thursday morning with less than 24 hours later, my client was going to be out of business. Uh, and we, and this was uh, back when uh, faxes were still a thing. And that afternoon, we got a fax from the Court of Appeal with the stay uh, of, the, of the injunction order which then allowed the entire case to proceed. And ultimately at the end of a very, many, many more years of, of legal process and, and, and the largest, uh, the longest oral argument I ever had because it ended up being like nine consolidated appeals and like a 700 or so volume record, appellate record. And the oral argument was set for, it was about two hours uh, for the oral argument, which was pretty exhausting, but we ended up winning. And now my client is one of the, 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 the leading uh, test preparation companies uh, in, in, in the country. In fact, this weekend, uh, we saw uh, some of our favorite cousins for the first time in over a year. Uh, and uh, the older daughter of my cousins is, is, is thinking, is, start, is in college and is thinking of applying to law school. And so I'm like, well, uh, like I, I know what else that test prep company you should use. And so <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, I never took the LSAT, but I, I took the practices for it because I always thought the questions were just a lot of fun. Um, I, I, maybe I missed my calling go into law, but now I work with attorneys all the time. So uh, <laughs> but that's funny. I like I like it. it's a kind of a David and Goliath uh, story and, and, and David won. <laughs> you helped David win. You were the sling uh, that, that brought him <laughs> victory. So that's awesome. Um, well, let me just ask you one more question. And then maybe we can talk for just a minute about some of the, the pro bono work, the charity work that you do as well, because um, I, I do want to dig into that. But uh, this is a question that people have liked me asking. So I'm going to ask it. If you had a magic wand and you could wave it, and change one thing about the law, uh, whether it affects you or your clients. It can be something that's just a personal pet peeve, or it's something that drastically is holding people back. What would you change with your magic wand and why? I think it's what we've talked about, uh, civility amongst lawyers, because uh, I, I think too, too often I see too many. Luckily, I will say in the appellate bar, um, most appellate lawyers are, uh, they go into appellate law in part because they're sort of more civil and more intellectual. And, you know, and so, you know, any case I have where it's an appellate specialist on the other side, I've never had uh, an issue because it's, it's a small community. I know most of them, like, you know, um, you know, I, 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 and it's not that they're not zealously advocating their client for their clients and that I'm not. So it's just that when we have to deal with each other for, you know, routine sort of briefing stipulations for brief, or, or for, you know, extensions of time or, uh, or just, you know, issues with the record that need, you know, that can best be worked out, you know, if you can work it out, um, you know, they'll, they'll work things out professionally and civilly. It's, it's a lot of trial lawyers, frankly, are not very civil. Uh, and so when I'm opposing a trial lawyer on appeal, you know, I'll just give like my, my favorite, and this has happened far way more than once, uh, where if I'm the appellant and, and, and under California, the parties are allowed to stipulate to uh, a certain number of extensions for their appellate briefs. So I've reached out many times to opposing counsel when I'm the appellant asking uh, for a 30 or a 60 day extension for my opening brief. And I'm told like, no way, but with a lot more expletives and 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 lack of civility. So then I just go and make my application to the court, and it's inevitably granted. And what happens is when their time for their answering brief is due, I'll get a call from them saying, "So would you stipulate to sixty days?" And of course, my first action is just like, "Oh, maybe I should give you the same answer that you gave me." And I think about that, and then I take a deep breath, and then I'm like. Sure, but I always sort of want, I want to ask them, and I never have. Like, 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 what type of like what type of gall do you have to like come <laughs> ask me for the same thing that you denied to me? Like, but I, I still give it to them, but it, it is irritating. <laughs> 
Well, once again, I think you're proving yourself to be one of the people that's making the change and it starts with that inner disposition and uh, the world is going to continue to be a crazy and not so wonderful place as long as uh, people are not living that lifestyle. So I want to commend you. Just it sounds like you've seen in this conversation, especially Jeremy, you seem like the type of guy that very, very much. Um, well, I'd say I feel like we have a lot in common as well. I don't know where you line up perfectly politically, but it sounds like we probably have a lot of overlap in those areas. But uh, dispositionally as well, I think it's very, very important to have that uh, more of a patient disposition. Um, so that's uh, that's a good thing. So now you had mentioned through your synagogue, you do some work uh, with with kids uh, and you do some pro bono stuff and, and some, some teaching stuff. Let's uh, let's end on a, on a really high note. Let's talk about that stuff a little bit. And even if you want to give a plug for whatever you're doing or, or whatever it makes sense to do, go for that. Sure. Well, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, lawyers as a whole, as a class are very privileged. And, I, I you know, I tend to believe that those who are privileged should use their privilege to help others where they can. And so I think lawyers do have a responsibility to do pro bono work. And so I've always, you know, for many years, I, I directed the uh, Ninth Circuit Clinic at Pepperdine Law School, where I supervise students representing, you know, prisoners and non-prisoners in various different civil rights actions where their cases had been dismissed. And, you know, we had, you know, ended up getting reversals and reinstating their cases, like, you know, about 75% of the time, which is a pretty, pretty amazing stat. And now two of my wonderful partners have taken over for me and are continuing to run the Pepperdine Clinic and taking it to new heights. Um, I've done a lot of work in recent years with the F Family Violence Appellate Project, which does a lot of really good work in representing uh, people who are victims of domestic violence and, you know, there's a lot of appeals involving uh, denied restraining orders or it comes up a lot of times in the context of spousal support and, and so it's been a re real joy to try to help our, our clients, uh, you know, navigate some really difficult uh, personal challenges uh, uh, and knock on wood so far uh, pretty successfully. And then just, you know, outside of the law, uh, you, you know, um, my synagogue many years ago uh, helped found this organization called Wise Readers to Leaders, uh, where we started about 10 years ago uh, with a, a six-week summer program helping 50 kids from Title I schools in LA, which are, those are the uh, sort of the poorest uh, schools where a huge percentage are, uh, you know, need school lunches uh, and the like. And providing a summer literacy program, we've been able to, through generous donors, uh, build it up so that we're now helping about five to 600 students uh, a year. And instead of just being a summer program, it's a year round sort of mentoring uh, program. We, we, uh, we, we have a lot of teen volunteers through local high schools, as well as college students who are, who are the primary teachers. Uh, and we've been able to do a lot of good, especially in COVID, we've had to shift to sort of a virtual like, like everything else, but you know, the feedback we got was that our virtual programming last summer really helped fill in the gaps of some of the lost learning. And you know, we've now had a chance to do a lot of studies uh, and, and there's, the, the, you know, there's this uh, actually demonstrated um, sort of phenomena called the summer slide where you know, students who don't, who don't have enriching summers end up you know, losing what they learned from the prior year and that, that, and then have to, when they start the next grade, have to be in sort of catch up mode so that they, and it's sort of a vicious cycle and you end up over the course of a, you know, 13 years in, in school, you end up losing about a year of, of schooling essentially because you're always trying to catch up. And so part of our goal and our program is to, is to, is to eliminate the summer slide. And, and you know, children in more privileged families uh, have been able to eliminate this because you know they go to in, they go to summer camps and have enrichment through the summer, and so that it's not an issue. But our more underprivileged kids in, in our community don't have those options, and so you know, we've been, you know, very fortunate to be able to, to provide that. And so you know, I, I think you know it's important for. You know, uh, my, my wife always says that we should try to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And so this is in a small way. I mean, I know there are bigger problems, and we have. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if I can help do something to help 600 kids, that's 600 kids who are in better shape than they were. And if, if, everyone, if everyone would help 600 kids, then we'd be in a much better country. Absolutely. Well, and when you help kids too, that's like, uh, it's like an investment, right? Because that one kid, if you put them on the right path, you help them get further than they could have gotten, they're going to affect other people. And the more people they affect, I mean, it literally can have an exponential reach. So 600 kids is absolutely, absolutely nothing to sneer at. That is amazing. And uh, 
great work. Seriously. That is awesome. So, well, um, I think that's uh, probably about the end of uh, what I've got here. I do always like to give uh, my guests the, the last word. Are there any uh, parting thoughts or, or parting comments you'd like to leave our listeners with Jeremy? Uh, no, I, I mean, I just, I would encourage your listeners, you know, as we've been talking about today, you know, I think change really requires it's one person at a time. And if, and if, if, if each of your listeners uh, commits to being, you know, more civil and litigation and, and, and less, polarizing it, it, through uh, about the judiciary, then, you know, I think one person at a time, just like helping one child at a time, I think makes a difference. I think one person at a time having sort of a, you know, a change in, in, in their approach uh, can make a difference too. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Well, Jeremy, thank you for taking time to meet with me today. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like I've learned a lot. I, uh, I really enjoy speaking with people that are at the top of their game. And I think that you've got some really keen insights. Um, and actually, you kind of helped me process through a few thoughts that I've had recently as well, um, just about a lot of the, the contentiousness in our in our society. Uh, which is already very litigious, but now it's just becoming uncivil. And I do think that uh, civility is very important. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, as always, of course, you guys are listening to The Attorney Post, uh, where we interview people who are at the top of their legal game. I've been talking with Jeremy Rosen, who is a partner over at Hordovitz Levy. You can visit them online at hordovitzlevy.com, H-O-R-V-I-T-Z-L-E-V-Y.com. Of course, we'll always, as always, have a link to that down in the show notes as well. Uh, I'm your host, Justin West. This is been the attorney post you can find us of course online on youtube we're also on apple spotify um all of the different podcasts hosts out there google um i feel like there's a dozen stitcher etc uh, as always it also benefits us if you can give us a like and a share uh so please feel free to do that as well and until next time again i'm your host justin west i've been speaking with jeremy rosen and as we talked about today be good people be better people and uh be the change that you want to see in the world thank you very much guys Bye-bye.